I want to thank you both, Joel and Kelly, for taking your time out to meet with us today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about liberal arts, and we're going to kind of explore what the career um, industry is kind of looking like with regards to education, politics, and research. Um, we wanted to take some of your time today to kind of focus in on interviewing skills, career development, and just kind of explore um, some of the ways in which you navigated your career as well. Um, and so I wanted to read off your bios really quickly so that the students have an overview of who's here. Um, and then um, for students who do watch this prior to attending the career fair, maybe they'll even reach out to you and, and want to further discuss um, just kind of picking your brain some of the different ways that they too can navigate their careers. Uh, so Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. So Kelly Bapovong serves as the Outreach Coordinator for Heritage Youth Leaders Program. In this role, she identifies, trains, and recruits the next generation of conservative leaders while facilitating Young Leaders Program alumni relations. Bapovong is a fellow with the Public Interest Fellowship and chairman of the Circio, um, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, Circio Society, and she has made multiple media appearances on Fox News. Fox Business, CBS, ABC, NBC, NPR, and BBC. Additionally, she has been published in the Wall Street Journal, and Kelly earned a bachelor's degree in government from Harvard College with a secondary in the regional studies of Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. Additionally, she earned a language citation for fluency in French after studying at Science Po in Paris. She is originally from Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and currently resides in Washington, D.C. So we're happy to have you, Kelly. Thank you so much. And Joel Vanderwarp, he is the program director at the Valor Institute. Prior to joining Valor, Joel served as a humanities teacher and coach at Glendale Preparatory Academy from 2010 to 2014, and as a teacher, coach, athletic director, and assistant headmaster at Great Hearts, Monte Vista, in San Antonio, Texas. He has years of experience directing student life and mentorship programs, senior thesis projects, curriculum development, and faculty and leadership formation. Joel is a graduate of Hillsdale College, where he studied history and English. His wife and three children reside in San Diego, California. So again, we're happy to have you both. So we're going to start off with the first question here, and I know I read off some of your bio, but if you could just dive into it a little bit more for us and tell us about your journey and why you chose your industry specifically to work in. And um, Joel, I'm going to go ahead and start with you, and then Kelly will go over to you. Yeah, great. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll say yeah, just a few words about my journey um, I went to um, a public district school in Michigan growing up, uh, Milford, Michigan, um, enjoyed my time there. It wasn't um, uh, especially uh, formative in the classroom, although I had some, some great teachers. I had an excellent cross country and track and field coach, and that made me think um, I could be really happy uh, growing up uh, teaching and, and coaching, um, not really knowing what that track would look like. So I found my way eventually to Hillsdale College in Michigan and had a pretty transformative experience there. And from that point on, um, was pretty committed to a particular uh, kind of education in America, the, the classical education movement, um, which has been uh, rising for about 40 years or so in American education. So I uh, ended up uh, accepting a teaching position in, in uh, Arizona with the Great Hearts Academy, Glendale Preparatory Academy. Dave Williams was our, um, our headmaster there, um, and I've been uh, working with him and uh, his team um, basically ever since. Uh, so we, we helped develop an outstanding school in Arizona um, as part of the team that helped launch uh, Great Hearts San Antonio, which was the first uh, movement outside of Arizona for Great Hearts, which is now um, one of the largest classical school operators in the country. Um, had a great time uh, there, uh, becoming a better teacher, coach, and school leader, um, and uh, two years ago accepted a position um, to help found the Valor Institute, uh, which has a, a kind of unique position even within uh, a rather unique world, this, this classical education world. Uh, my job is, is um, almost entirely spent on, on formation of our faculty, our school leaders, our executive team, 
we do programs with our board members and um, I'm heavily involved in, in um, our hiring and recruiting efforts as well, which is uh, something that we consider as, as a first point of formation where people get to learn about who we are, what we're about, what we love, and um, invite them into, um, into Valor and our, our endeavors. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that, 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 that's my journey. It's been um, almost exclusively in K-12 education, although we, we have a lot of friends and a lot of connections um, in academia and are starting to branch out into that world mm -hmm. in the coming years as well. Great, fantastic. Kelly, we'll go well, ahead. Over. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. So uh, to share a little bit of background on me, I grew up in Rhode Island, as you said, um, grew up going to public schools and never really thought as much about politics or kind of the ideology or principles in politics underlying um, kind of all of these things that are thrown around in our everyday discussion. So when I got to college, uh, one of the big things that I wanted to do was just discover kind of what is liberalism, what is conservatism, how can you get involved, um, what, how are policies crafted, how are policies made, and that eventually led me to Heritage um, as a think tank. So when I was in college, I was a government major and studying Russia and French kind of thought I was going down this foreign service or diplomat route. Uh, didn't ever envision myself kind of working in the movement or in a think tank space, but eventually um, ended up back at Heritage. So this has been my first job after graduation, still pretty young, um, have really, really enjoyed it. And in my role, I do our campus and conference outreach. Mm -hmm. So I travel to kind of CPAC and TPUSA and all the different conservative conferences, kind of meeting them and uh, talking to them about what programs Heritage offers when it comes to our internships and educational programming, such as the Academy. So I eventually just found a big passion for working with a younger generation and kind of showing them how principles, policies are made and kind of what ideologies are. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what my journey has been and why I've decided to work in think tanks. I really just believe in the mission um, that all of them stand for and kind of how they go about crafting public policy. But mm -hmm. in my life outside of that, I'm, I've kind of been involved in a lot of fellowships and educational programming. So I run something called the Cicero uh, Society in DC, okay. so based off of Cicero's works, mm -hmm. um, and just talking about politics and uh, philosophy together with a group of um, other young professionals. And I'm part of the Public Interest Fellowship, mm -hmm. um, which educates uh, about 20 young professionals as well in philosophy and public policy. That's fantastic. Both of you have wonderful journeys, great stories. And um, I just want to, I guess that really does flow well into my next question. Um, and I wanted to focus on as a professional um, working with developing talent um, and working with um, individuals who are kind of, you know, on this journey themselves, um, entering the workforce. What is some advice that you could give college students about the importance of securing a strong internship fellowship or career development opportunity. Um, and Kelly, I'm going to start with you this time. Sure. Yeah. So I think that um, securing an internship or fellowship or whatever educational program mm -hmm. is great one for you to be able to get that work experience or to be able to dip your toes in that field. Uh, but two is also really important in your intellectual formation. So being able to be part of a program that's going to emphasize teaching you um, kind of politics or policies or anything along those lines without just doing the work component is really important in my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, you're never going to know what you want to do. You might have an idea of it, but you're never actually going to know what you want to do mm -hmm. until you start doing it yeah. um, is my advice. And I hopped around a lot of different internships and fellowships when I was in college. I did something in business. I did something at a think tank. I did political consulting. I did finance. I did kind of everything mm -hmm. just to test out kind of what really spoke to me. Um, and while I was able to gain something from no matter what I did, mm -hmm. it really gives you kind of boots on the ground and understanding of what those organizations are doing every day um, and how they're going about their work. It's, mm -hmm. it's so important to do an internship. And when we're recruiting for um, 
heritage and looking for what strong candidates are as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, those kind of with prior work experience or with previous um, research are always going to stick out to us in the application process. So it's not only important for kind of uh, your formation now and kind of what you can do while you're in college, but also for future internship and job prospects. That's fantastic. Great advice. Thank you. Joel, um, what is some advice that you have to give? Yeah, well, um, yeah, K-12 education, you often don't have the same kind of internship uh, season, where, which is usually in the summer for, for a, lot of, uh, a lot of industries. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities um, to spend time in a classroom as a tutor or as a classroom aide, uh, depending on your university, if you're in a, you know, a CUA, like the education department. But even if you're not in the education department, there are a lot of opportunities for you to get some exposure in schools, if you're a philosophy major, English major. Um, and that's a really good time actually for you uh, to figure out if this is maybe something you're interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, it may be that you're in a school that um, that has some some real challenges and you have to kind of see through, is this is this just a matter of maybe some dysfunction or, mm-hmm. or is this really something I'm not interested in doing? So there's definitely a discernment process there. Um, when, when we're hiring somebody, say, you know, right out of college or recently out of college, mm-hmm. we are looking for um, people who've done really meaningful things uh, with their time outside of the classroom. So some of the things that Kelly was saying, yeah, we want to look for people who have sought out real intellectual formation, mm-hmm. um, things that like the Heritage Foundation or Hertog. I mean, there are a ton of different uh, some work programs available, especially in the D.C. area, um, mm-hmm. that we recruit from and draw from. Um, not heritage yet, but maybe that's something down the road for us. Um, and and then above and beyond that, yeah, are there um, uh, is is somebody just uh, kind of taking the normal job that pays a, a certain a certain wage so they can get by, or are they really challenging themselves? Um, I I think uh, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, one summer, I actually I did an internship and, and worked for the National Forest Service in um, uh, in California and was a historical interpreter um, in in the in the Sierra Nevada mountains. So that really had nothing to do with a direct track for me to teach, um, but it was something I thought that was that was going to be really fascinating and could make uh, yeah w- would give me an experience that could then um, be brought to bear in a classroom setting that that maybe the students wouldn't have already. So something that's meaningful, something that's important, something that's challenging. I think, I think um, filling your life with that outside of the classroom is is really important. Yeah, that's fantastic. I actually um, was reading a, a book, um, and it was by Leonard Lauder, um, the son of Estee Lauder, um, running the Estee Lauder companies. Um, and he spoke about a time in his life where um, he decided to go into the military, even though it had nothing to do with business, um, nothing to do with cosmetics. For him, it was a chance to kind of develop leadership skills. Um, and since he had kind of just come up um, based upon his mother's work um, and his watching his father, um, he figured that this would be a good opportunity for him to kind of learn the importance of discipline and some of those behaviors based skills um, that he could utilize in managing um, the company and moving forward. And he he never regrets any aspect of it. He thinks it was a fantastic experience. And for him, it was even a little bit of a humbling experience, starting at the bottom, not knowing a whole lot about um, the military industry codes, different things to say, whatever have you, and moving forward in that. Um, and so I think um, the information that both of you are giving with regards to um, just securing those opportunities finding yourself, finding your um, your strengths and your skills and challenging yourself. Um, I think this is all really valuable information. Um, with that, do you have any uh, tips for best practices when it comes to interviewing? Um, Joel, I'm going to start with you and then we'll go back over to Kelly. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the cliches is, is to be yourself. And um, I think that can mean a lot of different things, but uh, when I'm interviewing somebody, what I want to see is a certain kind of composure Mm -hmm. and uh, integrity. Um, So the person isn't putting on airs. They're not trying to be someone they aren't. They're not trying to uh, kind of posture themselves in a way that they think is going to be most appealing um, to me. I think it's pretty easy to see that. 
that uh, you can see that pretty quickly if you have spent any time hiring um, interns or, um, or or young people. So um, a certain amount of uh, integrity, right? To be who you actually are, uh, you're be- certainly put forward your best your best self, but to be who you are. Um, and what I mean by composure, I think this is this is probably pretty difficult for somebody who's in a position where maybe they feel a, a certain level of nerves. I think that's always the case. Um, but I think it's really important if you're a candidate um, to recognize that not all, all people hiring are the exact same, and you're going to have to read the room over the course of the interview and figure out, is this person kind of playful and, and kind of wants to joke around and see my my kind of lighter side, or is this something that's really serious and I need to be as professional and straightforward, uh, maybe concise as possible? Mm-hmm. And if you if you don't have composure in a situation like that, you know, all you're doing is thinking about yourself and how you're behaving and, and presenting yourself and not actually what the other person is offering to you. So um, mm-hmm. be, be able to read the room, be able to be a little bit flexible in the way that you're presenting yourself and uh, and and run run with the interview according in some ways to um, the posture and the personality of, of the person who's conducting the interview. Thank you. That yeah, that's great. Um, be yourself and be flexible. Read the room. Thanks, Kelly. What about you? Yeah, I I want to echo everything that Joel said. Um, those are all great points and something that I've noticed a lot in uh, kind of interviewing candidates as well. But mm-hmm. one thing that I want to say um, too is leave space for the interviewer. I have a lot of candidates who will come in and just start kind of bombarding me with questions and not giving me enough time to kind of process what they've told me or leaving space for me to ask them questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Kind of read your interviewer when it comes to giving them responses. I like to start every interview off generally telling them a little bit about myself and then asking them to do the same. So I, I hate the cliche, like, tell me about yourself question, but it is really helpful in kind of just framing Mm -hmm. where they're at, what they're interested in, what they're looking to do. Mm -hmm. I have some people who will give me kind of three sentences to that, or I'll have people start going on telling me about their whole life story for about Mm -hmm. five, 10 minutes. And Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the one thing to just be cognizant of, like be able to read how your interviewer is responding, kind of what responses they're looking for. Um, The other thing that I want to distinguish from is, informational interviews. Don't Mm -hmm. be afraid to ever reach out for informational interviews. I think the majority of people that you ask um, will be willing to do that. And it's a way for them to get to know you while also you being able to learn a little bit more about the company, Mm -hmm. maybe even before you're applying there or interviewing there. Mm -hmm. Um, But the one thing I'll say about that too is you have to come prepared to those. If you're going to ask for an informational interview, don't come in and kind of ask from the beginning, what is the company, kind of what is your role, what are some things that you do, show the effort and that you've done a little bit of research as well and come in with some tailored questions. Um, And a lot of interviews will always end with kind of, do you have any questions for me? Mm -hmm. And it's always a little bit weird when candidates don't have questions to ask you back. It, It makes them seem a little bit disinterested or like they weren't actually listening to you or that they're not interested in the opportunity. Um, So that's kind of my general advice is just to come prepared and have questions ready, Mm -hmm. have some answers to common interview questions ready to go as well. Yeah. Um, And yeah, just be honest and open, but be able to read the situation a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Give the the interviewer space to to ask the questions Um, and your responses be concise, but be open. Um, And I I agree with everything um, that both of you have said, especially with regards to when you do the research before um, and and you you start having the conversation with the interviewer and you kind of let it flow, you will have questions at the end to ask that are more than just surface deep, right? Um, and um, you may come already prepared with just based on your research, some you know inside questions just about you know the department or um, some questions with maybe a, about the the vision moving forward, what you've seen in any reports that have gone out. Um, but you may, after having that conversation and, and allowing the, the interviewer to, to kind of 
um, ask you the questions and, and really listen and take heed of what they're saying, um, it may develop into something even deeper uh, where they'll say, hey, you know what, we've got, we've got to do the next interview. We actually have to end it right now. And, and that's always good when the, when the time goes like that. Um, so that's great advice. Thank you so much. Um, and so my next question for you both, um, because we are facing a pretty hard time um, within the world, um, not, just, not just the nation, but the world as a whole, and we're operating in a global market, um, how do you think um, the pandemic has greatly altered internships um, and the job market? And, and what are some of the ways students can go about securing experiential learning in a way that's beneficial um, to their career? Um, and a way that's beneficial, you think, to the industry as well. Uh, and Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Sure. Yeah, so right now, um, what's been really good to see in the conservative movement and other organizations generally is that a lot of organizations are launching new kind of side programming. So without having to do kind of a full-on internship or full-on fellowship, mm -hmm. students are able to participate in webinars, they're able to participate in maybe day-long or weekend-long conferences where they're getting to learn. And so that's been something that we've been really noticing an uptick in. Heritage, for example, launched um, something called the Academy this past summer, which takes in about 200 fellows for about three to five hours a week. And every week they're just getting two different lectures and Q&A sessions and then getting to discuss with other members. Um, I think that showing that you're going above and beyond in kind of seeking out educational opportunities um, has been really important to us, can, showing us that maybe you're attending a webinar here or there, maybe you're doing um, an academy program like ours or attending a HERTOG or ISI or whatever it is, conference. Um, that's my general advice. There's a large swath of opportunities that have come up because of COVID um, and opportunities to not do kind of internships as well. And so mm -hmm. I would just encourage people to take advantage of those mm -hmm. um, because internships aren't really going to go away. We'll, we'll always still have the demand for them, but mm -hmm. these learning opportunities are something that might be unique to now that people should take advantage of. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Joel, um, over to you. Yeah, I don't have much else to add. I think uh, I think what Kelly's saying is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so many of the opportunities that you would have to grow are just are online right now. Yeah, and a lot of people I think have. I mean, we've been talking about Zoom fatigue for almost a year now. There's there's a lot of reasons to say I don't I don't want to do something virtual. I have enough of this in my life as it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's absolutely the case that this this probably won't. Uh, remain the same in, in two or three years. A lot of these organizations that run great programs are going to want to go back in person and, mm -hmm. and some of it will carry over, but it's the time to do it. And for us, we want to, we want to see people who are going to go out and, and take advantage of those opportunities, regardless of whether or not they're at their ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you get into our space, um, nothing is ever ideal. There's a lot of messiness and you have to have a certain level of fortitude to be, to be mm -hmm. great at anything. And that's, that's definitely the case as a teacher. So um, yeah, don't, uh, don't, don't despair, take advantage of what you can do the most that you can with your, with your time and, and show that you're um, that you have some ambition. Thank you. Thank you. And so um, I have one more question for both of you. Um, and um, this question, it kind of flows with that. Um, how do you see um, the job market evolving for your industry, specifically, though, um, with the Valor Institute and the Heritage Foundation, um, if there are any opportunities that you foresee moving forward that students should be aware of um, and how they can best prepare for those? Uh, so, Joel, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, the, the world that we're in, uh, the classical education world, the world that emphasizes um, kind of core liberal arts studies, mm -hmm. great books, education, um, these are some of the, the tag words that are associated with, um, with this movement. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's growing and it's only going to con continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, a lot of families have been dissatisfied with their education offerings in the last last year and are, are interested in in more choices, more opportunities, and 
and um, the schools that we that we run and and the friends that we have and other organizations um, are are going to be offering more and more of that. So I think um, I think the outlook is um, is is really sunny actually right now. So um, it's something I'm excited about. Again, it's a it's kind of regional thing. It's a niche thing for a lot of uh, a lot of CUA graduates who are attending a session like this. But this is a great time to get involved. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly, I'm going to go over to you now. Yeah. So I think kind of a similar sunny outlook when it comes to think tanks. We might all be remote right now, but we're we're still getting our work done. We're still kind of promoting our policies. And it's actually been a little bit better for us, honestly, because we used to maybe be able to have a meeting kind of with 12 stakeholders in the room that we could present our policies to. But now we can run a webinar and reach people who wouldn't have kind of gone out of their way and come to DC and come to this meeting in person. Um, so when it comes to think tanks, I, I just foresee a lot more flexibility when it comes to um, in-person versus virtual meetings or in-person versus virtual work. And that I think is going to remain with us for the internship as well. We've had a lot of success in our virtual internship. And while our program will still continue to run some things in person and have interns in person, I, I foresee virtual internships being something that we'll be able to offer in the future as well. So even those outside of the DC area um, will be able to participate. But I I think Heritage has still only been growing throughout the pandemic and so have other think tanks. Um, so sunny outlook here too. That's beautiful, wonderful, wonderful news. Um, and so at this time, um, I'm going to go ahead and end this session, but I wanna thank you both again for taking the time out uh, to connect with our students prior to the career fair um, at the end of the week. Um, if we do have a student that views this recording and they would like to get in touch with either one of you, um, I'm gonna ask that the student emails careers uh, careers at cua.edu um, and then just put in the subject line um, career talk with liberal arts so that way um, we can connect um, you appropriately with regards to whether or not you'd like to speak with Kelly or Joel further um, and that way we can uh, receive your resume and, and we can go ahead and make those connections for you.